Taiki, and it's my privilege to be able to share a bit of word with you this morning. And, uh, and we're going to be jumping into John 18 and 19 in a couple of minutes, but I just want to remind you guys about where we are and orientate us a bit in our series. We are in week four of our sermon series titled King, King. And in this series, we've been delving deeper into the practice of beholding the King and how as we behold Him in all of His fullness, we become more of His kingdom, more of His dwelling place in our day-to-day life. But man, maybe it's just me. I don't know. If, for those of you that have been following the series and have been listening to the podcast and have, have been here, is it just me or are some of these preachers really difficult to wrestle through? I've heard some of the stuff Joe has dropped from this pulpit over the last few weeks, and it's been like, really? <laughs> just give me a week break, man. Just, just, and, um, and really, it's been like tough stuff that we have to actually chew through and, and wade through, and, and it's really challenged me in terms of how much real estate Jesus gets to occupy in my heart and in my life. There's this incredible guy called John Mark Comer, and and he speaks about the real estate this way, and and it's just somewhere, uh, something that I want to share with you this morning to orientate you, And, and he says, apprenticeship to Jesus is about turning your body into a temple, a place of overlap between heaven and earth, an advanced sign of what one day Jesus will do for the entire cosmos when heaven and earth are at long last reunited as one. This is the single most extraordinary opportunity in the entire universe to let your body become God's home. And it's set before you every single day. I mean, that rocks me. When I start to think about my body as as a place that I want God to occupy, my mind and my heart as a place that I want God to occupy more and more of. So can we just quickly pray for two seconds? Simple, sweet. Lord, as, as we just walk through the scriptures this morning, would you come and occupy more and more of the real estate of our hearts and minds? Would you come and just move into those spaces that maybe we're, we're just keeping from you, God? Would you just come and fill all of us and come and speak to us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today, I have the privilege of speaking to you guys about the authority of Jesus, which is not a simple thing. Um, When Joe gave me this one, I was like, really? Um, This one? Uh, You can take it? No. Um, But but Joe, wherever you are, uh, it's his birthday. So just in case he listens to the recording, can we all just say, happy birthday, Joe? Happy birthday, Joe. Great, because we're a family and that's what we do. But the question I want to try and answer for us today, however clumsily, is does Christ, does God have the final authority in our world and in our lives? So where do we start? Well, a good place to start as we're journeying towards Easter is John 18 and 19, and we're going to pick up in verse 28. And you guys will see, because I did not want to read the whole of John 18 and the whole of John 19 to you this morning, because we don't have that kind of time, I have taken out snippets, so just follow on the screens. But essentially, we're journeying towards Easter, and Jesus is journeying towards the cross, and we pick up where he is spending time with Pilate. And, and really, we pick up in verse 28, where it says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They did not enter the headquarters themselves. And when they speak about they, they're speaking about the Jews and the Pharisees. And, and they didn't enter themselves because they would have been defiled and unable to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and he said, What charge do you bring against this man? And they answered him, if this man weren't a criminal, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. Now, that isn't an answer to the question that Pilate was asking. They sort of dart around the question that he's asking. And Pilate keeps questioning Jesus in the next passage. He goes, Jesus, are you the king? Are you a king? Where is your kingdom? And he keeps asking because he's trying to figure out what is actually going on here between the Jewish people and this man that claims to be the king of the Jews. And, and Jesus eventually makes this profound statement in verse 38. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. 
If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But, but as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Now, Pilate, again, tries to release Jesus, and he keeps bringing Jesus out to the Jews, and he goes, why um, are you persecuting this man? I can't see any fault in him. Just let me release him. And he keeps coming to them, and eventually the Jews are like, no, although there's a tradition that says you can release one prisoner, we don't want Jesus to be released. We want this guy named Barabbas, a thief and murderer, to rather go free, but we want you to crucify Jesus. And we then pick up in verse 1 of chapter 19. It says, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers also twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and clothed him in a purple robe. And they kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were slapping his face. So Pilate keeps on trying to release Jesus. If you read this full passage, it's almost exhausting because he keeps coming back and he wants to set him free and he wants to let him go. But the Jews are just so insistent and they're overrunning him. And the Pharisees claim in that moment that Jesus broke their law by claiming to be the son of God. And, and they demand he be crucified again. And Pilate again starts to question Jesus. And we pick up in verse 9. He went back into the headquarters and he asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus didn't give him an answer. So Pilate said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you know I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? And Jesus replies like this. He says, you have no authority over me at all. If it hadn't been given to you from above, you have no authority. This is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. And Pilate keeps trying to release Jesus, but the Jews keep insisting he be crucified. And eventually Pilate just hands him over so that he can be crucified. And this passage is just so packed with gut-wrenching realities that Jesus, King Jesus is in the last days of his life, and in his time with Pilate, he's ridiculed, and he's flogged, and he's mistreated, and he's handed over to die. And at first, you almost feel like, whoa, this is God. This is the Son of God. Why didn't he just call on his power and decimate those coming against him? You know, like, think about every action movie you've ever seen, where it's just like, whoosh, they are done, and or for that matter, why didn't he simply just disappear and reappear somewhere else? Because we know he can do it. But it almost feels like Jesus is powerless in this moment. Especially when he declares that, that his kingdom is not here. That it's some other place. And if he were there, he'd never have been handed over. And, and in this moment, Jesus isn't speaking about authority He's not speaking about his authority right now as he speaks to Pilate. He, because he is the son of God, his authority is absolute, but he's speaking about time. He's speaking about time and he's saying that right now, this is not the place for him to take his rightful place as ruler of this place. But there will come a day when he will return and he'll take his rightful place as the king of all there is, even this place. Place. And that's why he has us pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do I believe that Jesus could have simply disappeared from Pilate's headquarters without a shadow of a doubt? I know. I know he could have. And, but, but the reality of this moment is he had his eyes on a different prize. It wasn't about comfort. It wasn't about freedom. It wasn't about establishing himself as the powerful king that the Jews were waiting for. It was a grander plan, the narrative, the narrative of which meant forever dealing with sin and death and setting us free. He was able to accept the path that was laid before him because he knew who his father was. And he knew that his father had authority over everything. And we see that in chapter 19 where Pilate says to Jesus in a different uh, translation, it says, you will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And he simply says, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. And Pilate's authority to crucify Jesus didn't intimidate Jesus at all. And it's weird because if somebody's going, I can put you to death 
wouldn't you find that intimidating? Wouldn't you be like, you know what, what? Oh, okay, maybe I should speak differently, act differently. But John Piper, um, many of you know him, a well-known author and Bible teacher, he says this about this passage. He says, not because Jesus wasn't intimidated, and he wasn't intimidated, not because Pilate was lying, not because he didn't have authority to crucify Jesus. He did. Rather, this authority didn't intimidate Jesus because it was derivative. It came from something else. Jesus says, it was given to you from above, which means it's really authoritative, not less, but more. So how is this not intimidating? Pilate not only has authority to kill Jesus, but he has God-given authority to kill him. This does not intimidate Jesus because Pilate's authority over Jesus is subordinate to God's authority over Pilate. Jesus gets his comfort at this moment, not because Pilate's will is powerless, but because Pilate's will is guided. Not because Jesus isn't in the hands of Pilate's fear, but because Pilate is in the hand of Jesus' father. And and this is quite a packed quote, but all it's essentially saying is Jesus was not afraid because he knew that his father had authority. And he knew that his father had given authority to Pilate to do this thing because he knew what the plan was. And this is the part of the passage that speaks to authority because Jesus doesn't fear what man can do because he knows what his father has planned to do and that the plan is good and that it will come to pass and it will be good and and it will be a collective good for all of humanity. And, And that doesn't mean he's not scared in the moment. We know that he was afraid when it came to moving towards the cross. That doesn't mean he found the journey or what he had to go through easy, but what it does mean is that he could walk each and every step out because he knew who his father was in that journey. Jesus sits before Pilate and he says, any authority you have has been given to you by God. In other words, what he's saying is, if my father needed to, he could stop this. He could stop you right now. But there's more going on here than meets the eye. That's essentially what Jesus is saying in this moment. So many of you know that Maya and I um, adopted a beautiful little girl about three years ago, and she's the light of our life, and she's a little bit crazy like us, so, um, so we love her to pieces. But the journey was a difficult one. Um, anyone that's looked into adoption law in our country knows that it's complicated, and there's so many people you rely on, so many people you're asking along the process, so many people you have to trust that you don't know that they're going to do the job right, that they're going to do what's right, and that they will eventually just give you that piece of paper that says, you know what, here, this child is now yours. And there's such fear that starts to form in your heart, because you're thinking, if one person just decides we're not the people... If one psychologist looks at our profile and says it's not us, if, if one person says I'm too old or there's this reason or that reason, then they could literally not give it to us. And there's something about fear that comes into your heart in that moment. Um, and, and it's probably the closest allegory I can pull to us having to put ourselves under government and, and under fear in that way and trusting that everybody along the way will be led. And you know what? God showed himself so faithful in that process. If I were to have believed that they had the power to do or undo what God has destined for our family, then I would have been wrecked. But all along, we held on to the promise of what God had said. We would have our daughter, and it was her, and it was clear. And there's something about realizing that that in our minds, we sometimes do this thing where we say, you know what, the government's authority, my boss's authority, some other authority supersedes God's authority in my life. And you know what, I I put this picture up because that lady on the left, uh, she is actually the the top-ranking judge of the children's court. And the day we went there, you can imagine, it's so much fear, because this is like three, like how many years journey, and we're sitting with her, and, uh, and we're in the queue, and we have to go in and to see her, and we're like, what if she just says no at this point? <laughs> and it sounds so irrational, and we're like, God, we're just trusting you. And you know what happened when we went into her chambers? We didn't even have to go into court. She brought us into her chambers, and she played with our little girl for 30 minutes, she already got to play with the paperwork and play with the stamps. And she got, got 
you know, just this most beautiful moment of this is your day. And God took all that fear and all the craziness and all the authority that we thought, you know what, God, these people have authority over this process and just reminded us again, you know what, no, I have the authority in this thing. So Jesus knew and he lived by what we need to start living out. Our Father has final authority over everything. And there's nothing that he cannot do. I'm going to say that again. There's nothing that he cannot do and nothing that he cannot redeem. Nothing that he cannot redeem. Jesus knew that God was using Pilate to let his plan come to fruition. But he only knew that because he knew his father's heart. Dallas Willard used to say this thing. He used to say, there's no problem in human life that apprenticeship to Jesus cannot solve. There's no problem in human life that apprenticeship to Jesus cannot solve. Essentially just saying there's nothing we cannot face if we keep our eyes on Jesus. But this brings us to a bit of a hard question because if we're talking about authority and, and I can share all the nice stories with you of everything that worked out. But if we're talking about authority, does, does that mean that I believe that God allows evil to happen to further his will? Because that's always the question we jump to, isn't it? And I'll be honest with you this morning. I don't believe God brings evil into this world, but I do believe that he will often take what was meant for evil and he will use it for good. And I believe God sometimes allows mankind to feel the repercussions of what they have wrought. We see it in the scriptures. But even so, I believe God can redeem even those situations. I believe we've got a father, a good good father who is in the messes of our world and our lives and who wants to redeem our marriages and our relationships and our workplaces, our cities and our world. And, and God's business is redemption. We, we are all evidence of that. We've seen him. I've seen him intervene and break through even the worst darkness to bring light And we're reminded of that at Easter as we look at the life of Jesus. But if we let him, God will reveal to us that it's not just at Easter that this is a reality, but there's an everyday reality of small redemptions taking place all around us. And he asks us to partner with him in the doing of those things. So if that is the authority of our God, it's the authority of Jesus, what is the correct response to that authority? And, and I, I think the first thing I'd say is we should run to the Father. There is this passage in Mark 15, starting at verse 33, and, um, and I just want to share that with us, and it's the death of Jesus. And it says, when it was noon, Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And when some of those standing there heard this, they said, see, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, fixed it on a stick, offered him a drink and said, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. So they were mocking him even then. And then Jesus let out a loud cry and he breathed his last. And and as he breathed his last, there's this curtain in the temple that was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who was standing opposite him saw the way he breathed his last, what did he say? He says, truly this man was the son of God. Truly this man was the son of God. And in this one short piece of scripture, we see Jesus do a few things. First of all, he feels abandonment and he feels separation from the Father, not because of anything he's done, but because of the sheer amount of humanity's sin that was laid upon him. He cries out and he breathes his last. And as he does, this curtain in the temple is torn in two. And and for those of you that know, the temple was sort of the place of worship. And there was this curtain which separated the open area that people were allowed to frequent from the area that people were not allowed to go in because that's where God's presence was. It was the holy of holies. And, And it was so holy. God's presence was so holy that if you entered into that space without purifying yourself, you risked death. You risk death. You could drop dead on the spot. 
And, and I want you to think about that for a second, because Jesus dies, and he once and for all deals with sin and death, and as he does, that curtain tears right in two as a symbol of what has just occurred. Jesus has restored free access to the Father, just as it was in Eden. We can now enter into his presence, no matter how dirty or sin-laden we might be, because Christ has made a way for us. And this is such a powerful picture for me. There's something about, um, my wife and I were chatting this morning in the car, and and yesterday, while I was trying to just finish up my sermon, uh, our daughter just kept coming into the room and running and wanting to play with me and show me something. And then it's this, and then it's that. And she had free access to her father. There was no thing. Even the door could not stop her. I think 10 doors could not stop her. Um, But there's just something about this picture of us having free access to enter into the Holy of Holies where that wasn't available to us before. On the cross, Jesus feels forsaken the same way we often do. I I think if we're all honest, there are those moments when we just feel, you know, abandoned and forsaken. And by his death, he tears this curtain, restoring the freedom with which we can run to God, restoring our identity. And it's like through his death and the coming resurrection, he declares definitively, if you are lost, if you are abandoned, if you are forgotten, if you don't know where to run to, if you've forgotten who you are, run to the Father who restores. I've opened up the way. And as, he, as, as Jesus does this, the centurion does the only thing he can possibly do. He worships. He looks up at Jesus and he goes, surely this is the Son of God. The enemy comes to tell us that crucifixion is all there is. I'm sure for the people standing there on that day, they were looking around and they were going, it's over. It's over. The light of the world has left. There is only darkness now. And that's what the enemy comes to tell us, that there's no resurrection coming. There's no resurrection for our workplaces, for our city, not for this world, not for South Africa in the coming future or for its ills. And we can choose whether we're going to press into the doubt or whether we're going to press into who our God is by worshiping him in the midst of our sorrow and our fear. The second thing we do as a response to Christ's authority is we don't run away from him. The first point was just we run to him, but the second thing is not away from him. I take great solace in the fact that Jesus had times when he just felt forsaken, when he just felt, you know what, God, this stinks, <laughs> I'm sure. And, and I'm, I'm making a very big statement, so small when I say that. I, I think there are just those times when, when we feel that. I know we've all had seasons. Everyone who's in Christ has had seasons where we've cried out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I have those seasons. Um, I've struggled for the longest time with anxiety. I really do struggle with it. I have most of my life, and a lot of it stems from a really chaotic upbringing. And despite having done a lot of the work, I've done a lot of Christian counseling, and I've done the therapy, and I've worked through a lot of the root of what causes my anxiety. And while it's better, it's still there. And, and it makes my life a little crazy sometimes, and it makes my family's life a little crazy sometimes. And I've asked God more times than I can count, God, would you just take this thing from me? But it's still there. That doesn't mean it will always be there. That doesn't mean I believe it will always be there. And I know there will come a day when it's no longer a part of who I am But I've come to realize that just because God does not do what I have asked him to do, just because he doesn't give me everything I petition for, even in the hard things, and I mean the very hard things like infertility or unemployment or or the death of someone who's suffering from cancer, just because he doesn't do something doesn't mean that he can't do it. So the question comes, and I know you're all sitting here probably asking it, so why doesn't he? If he can, why doesn't he? And the simple answer that I have for you is I don't know. I don't have the answer to why 
God sometimes does not act. I don't have the answer to why these things happen. All I know is that one day when I see him face to face and when he embraces me, I may get to ask those questions because I have a list, let me tell you. But then again, when I see him face to face, it's probably not going to matter all as much as it is now. I've seen people grieve the worst things imaginable. I've, I've seen them worship and praise God in the midst of their confusion and brokenness. I've, I've known people who have literally led worship at their spouse's funeral. And they stand there and they, they're pressing in because they know that when they worship and praise in the midst of their brokenness and confusion, God can work something in that moment. And they've taken to heart what we experience in Easter every year and, and what I hope will become an experience we have daily. They've literally taken to heart that out of the worst evil imaginable, God brought about the greatest good ever known. The worst evil took place on Good Friday. And out of it, God brought out the greatest good that was ever known. When I look at the life of Joseph in the scriptures, I see this man who, after having been sold into slavery, after having been rejected by his brothers, after having been falsely accused of rape, after having been imprisoned and forgotten, he could still declare that God used it all for good. <laughs> Now, I don't know about you, but if I'd been through all of that, I think I'd struggle a little bit in that moment to go, oh, God, you used it all for good. But God did because he used Joseph. He made him the second in command in all of Egypt, and he used him to save countless lives in the process. And, and Joseph has, had discovered what so many men and women of the faith have, that this life is not about our comfort. And yes, there will be seasons of great comfort because God is a good father, but this life is about growing in the likeness of Jesus. And that means the sweets and the sours, the sweets and the sours. And while God may not be able to reverse the things we've been through, let me tell you something. He's knee deep in it with us, and he will wade through the muck of our heartache and loss, and eventually the muck will be at our shins, and then our ankles, and there will come a day when we will see the sun again, and when we'll get to minister to those who are going through the same things we've been through. The last thing and probably the best response that I want to leave you with this morning before we just have a time of ministry is, is really that we need to remember that Sunday is coming. Wherever you are in the journey, you need to remember that Sunday is coming. One of the most encouraging sermons I have ever heard in my life was as a young Christian, and it was by a preacher and author named Tony Campolo. And, uh, and the brunt of his message was simply this, it's Friday but Sunday's coming. I just want to invite the worship team to come up. For those present at the crucifixion, nothing was ever going to be able to redeem what had taken place. Jesus was dead and he was gone and the light had gone out of their lives, but Sunday was coming. And even though Jesus had died, he would be raised to new life because nothing, no principality, no power, no enemy was or is greater than the authority of our God. So I want to ask you a question this morning for you. Do you believe that Sunday is coming? Do you believe that our God has the power and the authority to redeem even the most hopeless situation in your life? Do you believe that? Our elections are coming up, and, and so many of the conversations I hear are, are about, you know what, let's emigrate. Ireland seems nice this time of year. <laughs> and there's just something about us being the pocket of hope. We have to be the ones that carry it and believe that God is going to bring breakthrough, that God is going to redeem even the most impossible situations in our lives, in our city, in our country, in our world. If not, if you don't believe that God can redeem all things, then nothing I say from up here is ever going to convince you. Only time in His presence can do that. Only time in His presence can do that. 
This incredible retreat leader and spiritual director, Marjorie Thompson, tells the story of a conversation between an 18th century priest and an elderly peasant who would always come and sit alone in the church for for long hours, and he would just sit quietly in the church. And when the priest asked what he was doing, the old man simply replied the following. He said, I look at him, he looks at me, and we are happy. I look at him, he looks at me, and we are happy. And as I do, I'm transformed. I think we overcomplicate this Jesus thing sometimes. And sometimes simply being in the presence transforms us, transforms our minds, instills hope where there is no hope.